Dr. Felder was in many ways the heart and soul of our faculty for the years that he was among us. A very gracious person. Everybody loved him. He was very passionate in his teaching, so the students loved to take his classes. So, but beyond personality, which was big, he also wrote a book called Troubling Biblical Waters, Race, Class, and Family, which, which I'll pass, pass around for you all to look at. This is from 1989. Um, this book, basically opened up the field of African-American biblical interpretation. So that's um, 35 years ago, basically. Not that African-Americans hadn't done biblical interpretation before, but this really caught the attention of especially the black church. And it sold like wildfire. Still sells all these years later. Um, white churches, eh, not so much. White churches aren't interested in Black biblical interpretation, unfortunately. But when, when Felder was at Princeton, he was greatly disturbed by the, the biases that he felt there. It just, it really bothered him. And this book is the result of his being bothered. So it's the beginning of you know, his personal response to what he experienced at Princeton. And this is not to stick it to Princeton because Princeton was just typical of, of all the majority white institutions across the country of not seeing the fact that the biblical world extends beyond Egypt. And just as we talked about last week with the Queen of Sheba and Cush itself, which is not Sheba, but but Cush is, 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 the name Cush is in the, in the Bible over 50 times, many more times than some of the other places that everybody's heard of. And yet white biblical scholars give it short shrift. So he set out to change that. And he certainly made a huge impact within the African-American religious community. That impact is slow to come in the larger community because there's still essentially kind of who cares attitude. But this is this book is where it started, and it still sells again among among the black churches. Um, so important book. It followed he followed it up with another book, African American Biblical Interpretation, which is a book of essays. Uh, some of my favorite. The material that came from him indirectly is in that second book, but I couldn't quickly pick it, pick it up off the shelf. This is what came to hand. So I brought this and since this is the initial book. This is, uh, this is the one that I brought, but a very important person in, in many, many ways. Um, at Howard, I was always and to some degree still am after 35 years of the faculty and more than 50 years in the Community. I'm still an immigrant. I'm still a stranger. And yet Kane was more than any of the faculty members, the one who reached out to me and made me feel at home. He was, he was that sort of very generous of spirit kind of person. So that's one reason I feel so, so strongly about him, that he was, he truly welcomed the stranger, which not everybody did. So Anyway, um, 
In terms of this new material, this trajectories within the Hebrew Bible, we've been looking at trailblazers in terms of individual women. We're now going to look at the Hebrew Bible itself as a kind of a trailblazer, as a piece of literature in which we can look at a or a series of trajectories that start there, or in some senses start before there, but you can see the you know see the the, the path in the Hebrew Bible, and you can trace it beyond the Hebrew Bible into the New Testament. We're not doing that here because we're just focusing on Hebrew Bible in this class, but you can certainly see how this trajectory moves into the New Testament, and then you can trace it beyond that into church history and, and, and even world history in the way these principles that we see in, in the text in the Hebrew Bible have laid the foundation for justice movements that continue to play out even to this very day. We aren't finished. <laughs> We're a long way from finished. And sometimes it's two steps forward and one step back, one step forward, two steps back. You know, it's that's history is messy. And it was messy in the Hebrew Bible as well. There are 27 slides here. We may not get through them all today. I'm not sure, but if we don't, we can continue next week and then go from there into the next um, program class, whatever you want to call it, on trajectories of justice for women, which is a little shorter in the last one on sexual or gender minorities is shorter still. So I think we'll get it all in in three weeks, even if it's not all evenly divided. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move on to the next slide, um, which is introduction. Is anybody moving slides? Oh, okay, here we go. Um, so again, you know, the Hebrew Bible is not static. It reflects a revolutionary or and evolutionary development. So historians speak of a Neolithic revolution from approximately 9,500 to 4,500 BCE when agriculture spread all over the place, changing the world, moving people from being a hunter hunter gatherer society to farmer type societies. It took 5,000 years for this to happen, which is a long time. But over that period, the world changed as people changed their way of doing everything. Monotheistic religions were a similarly dramatic revolution that also took many millennia to develop. And in some senses, we are still in that revolution. Um, this began perhaps as early as the third millennium BCE, and as I say, in some ways still continues today. This revolution brought with it values of justice and equality, equity. So the Hebrew Bible was critical of the oppressive aspects of slavery, which was a given in pretty much every society in that day. The New Testament tried to erase the distinction between slave and free. The Quran provides a number of regulations designed to ameliorate the situation of slaves. It recommends freeing slaves, especially believing slaves. So that's in Surah 2.177. So this, this revolution, which at least textually you can see starting in the Hebrew Bible, moves out from there to the New Testament, to the Quran, and again into, into today as we continue to try to actualize these values. So, um, yeah, Nick, yeah, right. Uh, so, um, there was a generally concern for the poor, but in particular, debt slaves. So in the ancient Near East, a common cause of poverty was slavery. And the two most common ways of becoming a slave were being unable to pay your debts and being part of the losing side of war. But the former was the more common, not being able to pay your debts. 
as um, the, you know, the interest was high. Because there were no banks, the risk of people defaulting on loans had to be borne by individuals who provided the loans. Who, um, and therefore, if the interest was high, you get into a kind of a catch-22 situation. So people, <laughs> people were more likely to default as they had to pay back the original amount plus high interest, which could be as much as 50%. Think about the sharecroppers in our own recent history. Mm -hmm. Exactly the same situation. And, and today, payday loans with these incredibly high interest rates. Poor people sometimes can't get loans from banks. So what do they do? They go to these loan sharks who just eat them alive. So it's the same situation as we had in the ancient Near East because they didn't have modern banks. And, you know, it's, 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 what, it's not surprising, but it is what it is, or it was what it was. So um, throughout the ancient Near East, there was concern for the lot of the poor. Um, so the, the Israelites weren't unique in this. We can't say that they were better than others for having this concern. As early as the third millennium in Sumer, interest in social justice for the poor existed. Famously in Hammurabi's code in the second millennium, there was interest in protecting the poor and the weak in this law code. And he wanted to quote, cause justice to prevail in the land, to destroy the wicked and the evil, so that the strong might not oppress the weak, that justice might be dealt the orphan and the widow, to give justice to the oppressed. So um, anyway, loans, interest, and debts that led to slavery. Early second millennium Amorite law code set limits on how much interest could be charged to protect debtors and lessen debt enslavement. 20% for money and 33% 30, <clears throat> for grain. Assyrian law codes were 25% for money and 50% percent for grain. So, I mean, 20 and 33 doesn't sound great, but it is a little bit of an improvement on what the, what the uh, existing amounts were. So, interestingly, occasionally, Amorite kings released debt slaves, <clears throat> but not prisoners of war. For, farmland was returned. Sorry, let me do something about this. <clears throat> Amorite uh, kings released debt slaves, but not prisoners of war. Farmland was returned to the owners, but not commercial property. Individuals, usually farmers, were released from their debts, but not merchants. Many debts were owed to the palace. Consider the story of Rahab. Remember Rahab? Yeah. I normally think of prostitutes in the Bible <clears throat> as, as women who didn't have husbands or grown sons to protect them. So they end up independent women. And the only way independent women can protect them or can make, you know, make a livelihood is through prostitution. I mean, that's, that's my guess. But Rahab has a family. So she doesn't fit that category. What's going on with Rahab and her place of business is in the city wall, which is a very prominent place. How does she have such a, you know, an important piece of real estate? What's going on here? My bet is that her family owes debts to the king. She's a young, attractive woman. So the king sets her up in this expensive piece of real estate <coughs> as the head of a whorehouse mm -hmm. and the money goes to the king. She's a debt slave, is my guess. And I see the Bible doesn't say that, but it's the only way I know to make sense of their situation. And it also makes sense when the Israelites come She's quick to throw her lot in with the Israelite spies because she has no love for the king. 
she's ready to get out of there as fast as she can. Um, anyway, it all it all fits together, even though there's not any explicit evidence of that. It just kind of makes sense. One of these days, I'm going to write a paper on that. <laughs> I haven't gotten them, gotten my act to, together to do it yet. Um, anyway, debt slaves often worked for the temples because the temples were economic powerhouses and therefore release laws that the king put out could weaken the power of the temples. So there was a political aspect of this as well. You know, the king puts out a, a release law and that puts him in a better position vis-a-vis -vis the temples. So then the next slide, um, concern for the poor throughout the ancient Near East. Ancient Egyptian literature also shows a deep concern for the poor, for the oppressed. The wisdom literature of Egypt, including that of Amenemope, which we um, mentioned back when we were talking about Zipporah, is filled with this concern. And so we, have, we know biblical literature is impacted by this Egyptian wisdom literature. Um, the overarching philosophical religious principle we see in the uh, Egyptian literature is called ma'at, which basically translates as justice and order. So it required that the poor be cared for. Uh, this concern also showed up in Hittite and Canaanite literature of the second millennium. So ancient Israelite literature shouldn't be concerned considered to be unique in the concern for justice for the oppressed and the poor. Okay, so the changing, the next slide, changing the nature of the Israelite society. Unlike the more advanced, complex economic systems of some of Israel's neighbors, especially the kingdoms, um, Israel was comprised primarily of highland villages with a pastoral economy where barter was the primary mode of exchange. Loans were given in times of economic difficulty to help others in a basically a kind of a kinship-based society. Everyone was assumed to be family, you know, in a sort of extended family sort of, sort of way. This all changed in the eighth century with the rise of the Assyrian Empire and the Northern Kingdom was heavily involved with the Assyrian Empire. Trade developed between Israel and Assyria. The rich and the powerful in Israel began victimizing the poor. The prophets and the legal reformers cried out and they enunciated traditional beliefs because they could see what was happening to the, the poor members of society. And you see this in you know, Amos and Hosea and Micah, some of those earlier prophets are, are yelling and screaming about what's going on. They can see just like we see in our own day that the social structures that we're living with are making it worse and worse for the poor. It's not that different. So there's the next, next slide. Um, unique laws re regarding debt in Israel developed as a result of this situation. Israel may have been unique, even though it wasn't unique in its concern for the poor, but it may have been unique in condemning interest altogether. I mean, that's radical, but it was a response to this situation of the rich taking advantage of the poor the rich being involved with, with Assyria. Um, so in terms of the traje trajectories, what we believe is that the covenant code, which we find in Exodus, is part of the earliest law that we have. And then the middle set is Deuteronomy, 7th century Josiah. And then the, the last material is the priestly material that we find in Leviticus. We're not certain of all of that, but that's sort of the best guess, at least Ganus's best guess, and I'll go with him at this point. So this Exodus 22, 25, which is actually in English verse 24, says, if you lend money to my people, meaning, you know, Israelites, Hebrews, 
um, you shall not deal with them as a creditor. You shall not exact interest from them. Interest being the word neshek. If you take your neighbor's cloak as a guarantee, and the cloak was both a garment that you wore your outer garment during the day, sort of like a coat for us, but it's also the blanket you put on at night to keep you from being cold. So sort of double purpose thing. Um, if you take your neighbor's cloak as a guarantee, you shall restore it before the sun goes down because they need it to stay warm at night. Um, for it may be your neighbor's only clothing to use as a cover. And what else shall that person sleep? And when your neighbor cries out to me, I will listen, for I, God, the Lord, am compassionate. So that's an early, we think an early um, response to this problem of the rich taking advantage of the poor. And then um, ways around the law. As is often the case, the rich figure out ways around the new law. <laughs> nothing is nothing has changed. Human nature, greed, it's, it's, it's always there. So um, they came up with a new term for interest to get around uh, this problem. We can see this in Deuteronomy 23, which is sort of the mid period in a later law code. The lawyers responded, you shall not charge interest, neshek, on laws to another Israelite, interest on money, interest on provisions, interest on anything that is lent. Because apparently they were, you know, again, cha changing the rules a little bit. On loans to a foreigner, you may charge interest. They thought that was kosher. But in loans to another Israelite, you may not charge interest. So the Lord your God may bless you in all your, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that's, that's that part. And then the next slide, interest, encouragement to give the needy. And again, this is that middle period again, Deuteronomy 15, 7 to 8. If there is among you anyone in need, a member of your community, in any of your towns within the land that you, your, the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward your needy neighbor. You should rather open your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Don't loan, give. Um, every once in a while, somebody asks me for a loan. I said, no, I won't loan it to you, but I'll give it to you. You know, I don't want it back. It's, it's yours. Um, and then slide 12, laws about collateral for loan, another area that could be abused. Even if people could not charge interest, there were no laws against holding collateral for a loan. You can see where this is going. So Deuteron again, middle period, Deuteronomy 24, six, no one shall take a mill or an upper millstone in pledge for that would be hold, taking a life in pledge. You know, th this is what they used to make their bread. They had to grind out the grain to make the flour. Uh, and by the way, this is, remember that article from early on about the women's strength from, from, you know, so this was an essential piece of equipment that they used every day to make their bread every day. You take that away, they, they, don't, they don't have any food. So you can't use that for collateral. Um, and then 24, 10 to 13, when you make your neighbor a loan of any kind, you shall not go into the house to take the pledge. You shall wait outside while the person to whom you're making a loan brings the pledge out. And if the person is poor, you shall not sleep. And again, that's the same thing as before. But if, if, if you are getting a pledge, which they aren't happy about in the first place, you can't go in. The person has to bring it out. They want, don't want you going in to see what else the person may have in that house <laughs> that you might covet. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> They're going, they don't want you going in to case the place. Nothing new under the sun. All right, so then collateral in a further development in Deuteronomy 24, 17, you shall not deprive a resident alien or an orphan. So again, the most oppressed groups, you shall not take a widow's garment and pledge. Same thing as earlier, but, but now we're talking specifically about a widow. Remember you were a slave in Egypt and the Lord God redeemed you and so forth and so on. And then 36, do not take 
interest to get Neshek in advance or otherwise make a profit. Turbeat, another term, it's another coming, having to come up with new terms to get around loopholes that people have created from them. But fear your God, let them live with you. You shall not lend them your money at interest, taken in advance, or provide them food at a profit. So they're having to go, you know, close all these different loopholes that people were creating to get around this these concerns. And then um, additional laws for the poor, fallow year and poor persons tied. Watch, okay, we're fine. Um, Exodus 23, so we're now back at the early period. Six years you, so, you shall sow your land and gather its yield, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow so the poor of your people may eat. And what they leave, the wild animals may eat. You shall do the same with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. So this is interesting because the purpose that's stated here is for the poor. But interestingly, um, even today, people who practice natural, um, what do you call it? I mean, land management, management thank you, uh, do this because rather than using a lot of chemicals on their land, this is a way of keeping the land um, fertile. fertile, right, thank you. Um, I went up to Maine to a, a meditation retreat some years back and they also were doing this thing and they were explaining they had, you know, they left a certain percentage of their land fallow every year, but they planted certain things in it that were supposed to be help rejuvenate the land. And it, they didn't use this for anything. They just plowed it under at the end of the year. And that way they, they had a very uh, robust uh, agricultural thing going on there just by using these natural techniques. So what well, we do this today. The latest thing today is not to plow. Not to plow it, just to leave it. Leave it and then you just drill it. And then you just what? You just drill the ground because when you ah. when you plow, you just turn it all over and it doesn't help it. Ah. You just leave it intact and then just And then when you it. sow it the next time you just drill right. for the okay, that's that's well, cool. Well, but I'm not a <laughs> right. Very good. Okay. So um, I don't know what they did after after the year here, but um, and, and of course their purpose was for the people, but it probably had the side effect of keeping keeping the land uh, fertile uh, to, if they did this on a regular basis. Okay. So then Deuteronomy 14. Again, we're going to the middle period now. Every third year. Ah, this is a very interesting one. Because uh, this is one of the tithing texts that um, doesn't regularly get mentioned when we talk about tithing. Every third year, you shall bring out the full tithe of your produce for that year and store it within your towns. The Levites, because they have no allotment or inheritance with you, as well as the resident aliens, the orphans, and the widows in your towns, may come and eat their fill so that the Lord your God may bless you and so forth and so on. So here, the, the tithe is taken every year. One year out of three, it is for the widows, orphans, aliens, Levites. The other two years, and I don't have this text here, but it's in the same, same area. The other two years, everybody's supposed to bring the tithe. And then they are supposed to have a community party. I kid you not. <laughs> it's wonderful but nobody ever quotes this text <laughs> when they're talking about tithing because it doesn't fit their agenda. But there are a number of tithing texts, not just the ones that you hear when we're talking about tithing. And this is, this is my favorite. And, and, and we do this sort of thing in a sense when we, we, get, we gather, our, gather together for various sorts of meals. We bring our, and you know, but, but here it is as, as a, um, as a tithing text. Okay, so, right, yeah, yeah, it's a big potluck or, or Thanksgiving meal or, you know, anything like that. So anyway, on to 15, additional laws for the poor, uh, the law for day laborers, Israelite or foreign. So this one covers everybody. So this is, yeah, uh, 15. And Deuteronomy, we're into the middle period here. Uh, you shall not withhold the wages of poor or needy laborers, whether other Israelites or aliens who reside 
in your land in one of your towns. You shall pay them their wages daily before sunset because they are poor and their livelihood depends on them. Otherwise, they might cry to the Lord against you and you would incur guilt. So this is, you know, we don't think about this, but there are people like this today, the guys who uh, are out there in the corner in my neighborhood waiting, waiting for somebody to pick them up to you know, go, go do a day's work. Some of those people, you know, even today, if they don't get their wage at the end of the day, they don't get dinner, they and their family. And this was clearly the case back in biblical times. These, you, know, you can't give them a wage at the end of the week or certainly not at the end of the month. That's just not the way it worked for them. And so this is telling the, uh, the uh, who, who is doing the hiring, pay at the end of the day so that they get to eat, they and their family. Um, and then 16 additional laws for widows and this, this first one, Deuteronomy 24, 19, 21, is one we know well because it's the gleaning law that we get in the book of Ruth. Make sure that you uh, leave, leave enough so that the widows may, may glean. Um, and uh, <clears throat> let's see, Leviticus 19. So this is the later version. Um, and this one also relates to the vineyard. Leave enough grapes for the poor and the alien. And uh, again, I am the Lord your God. So those are, again, provisions for, for widows and aliens, anybody who is poor and otherwise won't, won't eat unless they can get that, that little bit extra. And then laws concerning slavery. Um, so again, as best we can tell, this, this, when we say first or unique, this can always be overturned by the next uh, discovery. But as of the time of Ganus's book, anyway, Israel appears to be the first ancient Near, East, Near Eastern society to challenge the assumptions of debt slavery and slavery in general. Um, under some circumstances, slaves could be released against their owner's wishes. If the master brutally beat the slave, and that's, that's Exodus, so that's an early one. Um, if a master beat a male or female slave and they died, the master could be punished. Again, Exodus, so early. If the master struck the eye or knocked out the tooth of a slave, the slave went free. Again, an early one. This sort of protection, as far as we know, was unique in the ancient Near East. And then the next one, um, this just continues that, provisions were made for the release of young girl slaves if they were not made full wives at an appropriate age, still, still Exodus. Now that might seem, we might have some question about that because we're talking about a young girl who's been taken into slavery and being essentially forced into marriage with the master. And that had, you know, we kind of say, mm, we, don't, we don't entirely like that. But the alternative is to be in that situation without the protection of marriage. At least if she's married, there is some protection. So that's sort of the, the, uh, the choices there. I mean, obviously it'd be better if she were released and allowed to go back home where she could make her, make her own choices or have you be married to somebody in, in her group. But if your only choices are to be married to the master or not, where you could be dealt with in, in much worse ways, then marriage was the better option. Um, especially important was the law that anyone who kidnapped someone to sell them into slavery would receive the death penalty. And that's that's pretty surprising. Joseph's brothers. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not to say that it always happened, but, but, but the law was on the books at least. Um, it only applied to young male children of free citizens of Babylon. Um, the Hebrew, but the Hebrew law applied to everyone, you know. Israelite citizen or anybody else. It, it was a, it did everybody. 
But more radical still was the Fugitive Slave Law, which of course we know in our own history was a very important issue in Deuteronomy. So this is later now. This law forbade returning fugitive slaves from foreign countries, contrary to the laws of most neighboring countries. As far as we know, Israel was unique in this. So if a slave from any neighboring country showed up in Israel, they were to keep that person and, and let them be free in their society and not return them to wherever they came from. Because again, they had been slaves in Egypt and they, they sided with, with the slave, even though they had their own slaves. <laughs> I'm not saying all of this is perfectly consistent, but okay, so verse, uh, verse um, slide 19. Again, the middle period, Deuteronomy 23, uh, you shall not return to their owners, slaves who have escaped to you from their owners, they shall, okay, that's just more of the same, sorry. Um, and then the, uh, the 20th, 20th, slide, 20th slide, laws concerning slave release. Exodus, back to the beginning. When you buy a male Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, but in the seventh, he shall go out a free person without debt. Sounds good. If he comes in single, he shall go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. All sounds good. But if his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be the masters. Not so good. And he shall go out alone. But if the slave declares, I love my master, my wife, my children, I will not go out a free person, then his master shall bring him before God. He shall be brought to the door or the doorpost, and his master shall pierce his ear and all, and he shall serve him for life. So you can see the, the, um, the master's incentive to make sure he gets his slave married and uh, so that the slave doesn't want to leave. Um, so... Uh, this, this, the uh, Sabbath year release is a kind of a way around that loophole. Um, Deuteronomy 15, 1 to 18. Every seventh year you shall grant a remission of debts. And this is the manner of the remission. Every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor. And since most people were slaves in the first place because of debt, and this, this should take care of it, um, so, and, and this is the man of the mission. Every debtor, every creditor shall remit the claim that is held against a neighbor, not exist, not exact, sorry, not exacting it because the Lord's remission has been proclaimed. Of a foreigner, you may exact it, but you must remit your claim on whatever any member of your community owes you. <clears throat> there will, however, be no one in need among you because the Lord is sure to bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you as a possession to occupy, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, so basically, you know, every seven years, there's supposed to be a general debt remission. Now, unfortunately, we don't have any test text that... You know, tell us this really happened. I mean, there's there's one I think in Jeremiah, but it, it happened and then, then they rescinded it. We're on the previous subject about releasing slaves. Yeah. I this may be the appropriate time to ask the question. Yeah. Could a master have multiple wives? Is this assumed to be the case? Yeah. Yeah. So we could have a number of wives. He could. He could. Okay. It was not common because economically. It was people couldn't afford it, mm -hmm. but there was no law against it. I mean, we have it certainly in the early period with the patriarchs, but after that, we certainly don't have stories talking about people with multiple wives. And I think it was because of the you know economics didn't didn't make it easy to do that, but nothing nothing forbade it. I mean, there were laws against um, adultery, but that's not a law against <laughs> multiple women <laughs> because because it. The, the, the law, I mean, adultery means not having sex between a, a woman who is married and a man who is not her husband, right? It doesn't say anything about a husband having more than one wife. 
um, you know, the difference between adultery and um, prostitution <clears throat> or uh, what? sex outside of marriage. Right, right. I mean, a man, a man can have sex outside of marriage. A woman can have sex. A woman who's not married can can have sex. I mean, that's what prostitutes were doing. That was not illegal. It was looked down on, but it wasn't illegal. But a woman who is married, if she has sex, she's in deep trouble. Um, and a woman didn't have multiple husbands. No, no, <laughs> right. Um, so a husband could have multiple wives. He could engage with prostitutes, um, but the women had many fewer options. And I've been told that that's because the man wanted to know that those children were his children and not somebody else's yeah. children. Yeah, yeah, apparently. Yeah. So let's see, where are we? 21? 22. Uh, 20, oh, all right, there we are. Yes. So this is more in the Sabbath year release. Oh, and so, yeah, just a continuation of that text. Um, and again, it has to do with, you know, opening your hand, willingly lending enough to meet the need, whatever it may be. Um, verse nine, be careful that you do not entertain a mean thought thinking the seventh year, the year of remission is near and therefore view your needy neighbor with hostility and give nothing. Your neighbor might cry to the Lord against you and you would incur guilt. Give liberally and be ungrudging when you do so. So on this account, the Lord your God will bless you and so forth. Again, getting around the, the, the rich oppressor's uh, desire to come up with loopholes around these laws. I mean, the, the point is that everybody in the society should view each other as kin and take care of each other and not be mean and be greedy and take advantage of their poor neighbors. Um, so, okay, so that's 22 and then 23, we're continuing with the same text. And if you send, send someone out, make sure you don't send them out empty handed, provide for them from your flock, your threshing floor, your wine press, giving them from your bounty. Um, and again, remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Um, but then verse 16, if this slave says, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household since he's well off with you, then you shall, and again, the, the all business again. All right. And then verse 20, or slide 24. <laughs> uh, can I just ask? Yes. You, Abby, was there a court or someone you could go to if you were in disagreement with them? No. Not, not any courts as any we as we know them. Rabbis, any judges. judges. I mean, no, not as we. I mean, there was the. Each family had a sort of a head of the family. Um, what in some cases is called a goel, uh, a redeemer. The, the goel is the head of the family, the, the oldest male who is responsible for getting anybody in his extended family out of slavery if they're sold into slavery or you know that sort of thing like we have in the book of Ruth um but if you disagreed with the master the master's always right okay. you have no recourse to you. we don't have any texts that tell us stories about that mm -hmm. is the problem so if it existed again we don't as far as I know we don't have stories to Tell us what happened. So we're we're dependent on the sources we have, which you know have a limited number number of incidents. Um, it seems like they're dependent on the fear of God. Yeah, of yeah, God. right, right. It's very, very, of course, in the, in the Book of Proverbs, the fear of God is 
you know, a major part of that. Um, so they're, 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 to some degree, they're, um, they're trying to get people motivated to do the right thing because they don't have this, the kind of system of courts that we have today. I mean, it even, you think about like when Solomon was king, people brought his cases, their cases to Solomon, to the king. So, I mean, there is ultimately the king, but if you've got a case, taking it to Jerusalem to the king is, you know, that's, that's not easy to do. You may not have the means, you know, to, to do that. So that, that's one, the one story that hit, you know, but short of that, I don't know. I, I love the way that, that each of these things ends with a positive and then the Lord will Right, and right, <laughs> right, right. As opposed to, and you'll be struck down right. you know, by the right. of God. Yeah, yeah. Like um, yeah, 24, um, you know, don't consider it a hardship when you send them out from you free persons because for six years they had given you services worth the wages of hired laborers and the Lord your God will bless you in all that you do. This particular one includes female as well as male. So it's just a reminder, hey, they worked for you for six years. You know, don't feel bad when in the seventh year you're letting them go out free persons. You got a lot of work out of them for, you know, just the cost of room and board. Um, Let's see. The last one's about the Jubilee. Yeah. We are yeah. Looking at the clock, we ought to probably we'll stop there. Yeah, because we're like, your liberation. Okay, so we got yeah, we got two. <laughs> your husband. Yeah, so we got two two that we'll do, do next time. We'll start with Jubilee, uh, and then the sort of the the conclusion, which is essentially to sort of see this this evolution over, over time. Um, and I'll start there and then we'll go into the women's good, good point. So that gives us a few minutes to kind of uh, uh, reflect on, on all of this. Um, it's really interesting to me that all the people who use the Bible to support slavery mm -hmm. never picked up on any of these laws. Right, right. <laughs> They just say well, that <clears throat> slavery was a given, which is true. It, you know, it was a given, and yet they were trying to um, keep it in check, trying to find ways to help the, you know, the debt slaves. Um, and, and, and when we get to the Jubilee, of course, which we don't know whether it actually happened or not, they were working toward justice. You know, there, there is this trajectory which we you know moves into the New Testament and then moves into church history. So if you just look at individual laws and to just look at the fact of slavery, it's insufficient to say what the Bible says about slavery. But if your agenda is to support slavery, I mean you can certainly say there was slavery. Yes, there was. And people, I mean just like today, if you want to say that um, you know, there, there, there are laws that uh, limit women's or gays or name your, your group, our full participation, that's true. There are, but that's not the whole story. I think we have to look at the, what our society has done over time to improve the, uh, the rights that any particular group has, even if they aren't perfect at this given moment. And sometimes it's two, you know, two steps forward, one back or vice versa. You know, our society has moved in a good direction for most groups, 